All right, we're journeying through the Gospel of John, and today we are on John 7. And John 7 is an interesting, uh, very important chapter in this whole book. And you've got to remember, that's why uh, like these, little, these journals are helpful, we have stuff on the website, that this, each one of these weeks is a story in and of itself, it's making a point in and of itself, but it fits better into the bigger picture of the rest of it. And so you got to kind of remember that. This is one of the chapters that really kind of pulls on some of the other surrounding chapters to make sense of it. And I'll explain some of that as we go through. But really what this is, is a, is a, <laughs> a chapter of people kind of getting confused about who Jesus is. Like, they think he's someone, they're, they, they're arguing, like, Jesus is doing things, and people are confused about it. And I actually was like, man, if that doesn't sound like today... I don't, you know, so this is a pretty good, I think what, what I'm trying to say with this is, even though a lot of the details of this chapter are very specific, and they're very particular to the Jewish people of that time, and some of the things I'm going to have to explain so you even understand what he's talking about, the interaction that the people are having with Jesus is exactly the same as the way people interact with Jesus now. And, and I think to hold some of this, like, if you've noticed over the last couple chapters, water keeps showing up. And like the woman at the well, she's got the water, like Byron is preaching about. Woman at the well, and, she's, and he's like, yeah, I got water that's like, you know, like the real water. She's like, well, can I have that water? Because I hate getting this water. And she's like stuck in this, you know, water thing. And like the second half of the chapter that Pastor Rich spoke on last week, because Jesus feeds the thousands of people with, like, you know, just nothing really to work with but the Holy Spirit. And then goes on and talks about himself as the bread of life, which we didn't really cover that part in the message. But he's talking about the bread of life, and people are like, can we have this bread? Because we're like really tired of like having to like make bread and eat and stuff. And he's like, guys, like, <laughs> and so what I want you to, you're going to see that same sort of issue happening again here where we tend to do things like this. And I think this works out in a lot of people's different, differently where you go, this is like a literal thing. And then this is like a spiritual thing. And you might use a slightly different word for that. Okay. Where you go like, this is like my, for some of us, it looks like this. Like this is like my real life. Like where I like, you know, watch YouTube and go to work or go to school or, you know, watch sports or whatever. This is where I do. And then, then there's like this spiritual thing over here, which is different. And like, this is the, maybe the churchy thing or like when I pray with my kids or something like that, you know, or it could be that like for some of us that like the literal thing is like, yeah, this is like the junk I got to do every day, you know, the life, whatever. And then the spiritual thing is like, oh, this is like the good stuff where a God is and like, you know, not that junk over there, you know, that stuff I have to deal with every day. You know, this is the higher stuff. And what I'm going to try to argue with you is is in order for this to start making sense better is you can't do that. I don't think like at all. It's not a biblical mindset. The mindset is you just have a life. And it's both of these things. And it's kind of both of these things all the time. And this is biblical, 100%. And it's how Jesus is talking right now. You have one life. You are one person. You can't just divide yourself up like this. And usually when you... And I would say even if you could do that, which I don't think you could, I would venture the guess that we're probably doing it wrong. So, (laughs) But what is really important, it reminded me of... um, There's an episode in The Simpsons where... Did I lose some of you on that? There's an episode in The Simpsons where um, <laughs> Homer wants to go to the all-you-can-eat seafood restaurant, and Marge is a little bit concerned because she's got a fish allergy. And this scene right here is Marge is going, she's like, well, that's okay, because you can get the all-you-can-eat seafood. I'll just get something else. And so she's thinking there's seafood, and then there's non-seafood. And she has this interaction with that waiter guy there. She's like, well, does everything on the menu have fish in it? And he goes, yes. She goes, what about the bread? Does it have fish in it? Yes. This is the interaction she has. <laughs> so what I'm saying is, this is my weird, twisted mind. When you look at your life as literal or a fish, and then spiritual, not fish, and the guy's like, yes. There is, so is, is, there, is there literal life in it? Yes. Is there, so really what I'm trying to say is everything is spiritual, and everything is literal. They don't divide the way they're saying. Does everything have spirit in it? Yes. And is God ever, you know, yes. So that's the kind of thing. I also have another quote. (laughs) 
It's about understanding Jesus is difficult. You might think like, well, I, I, you, you might even think you got a good grip on Jesus. Like, I got him figured out pretty well. And then he'll show up and do something unex- unexpected, which you're going to see like in the next chapter, where it's like, I got this guy figured out, you know. And then he does something, and you're like, that's not what I thought he was going to do at all. And here's the thing about Jesus. He's not like a guy in a story just from 2,000 years ago. The whole Christian thing is he died for our sins, but he rose again. He's alive right now. So just like I could tell you James here, I'm like, well, James really loves, you know, fish. And he could be like, stand up and go, no, I don't. And I'd go, just sit down. We, we read the book. We know you like fish. And he's like, I don't, though. Like, you're reading it wrong. This is how Jesus is, and this is how Jesus interacts with our understanding often. This is a quote that I have that <laughs> I couldn't find. So I wrote it as best as I could remember, and I quoted who I think said it. So... Let me just read it to you, and then I'll explain what it's supposed to say. No understanding or or interpretation of Jesus is sufficient except one at which he is the center, or something like that. And that was said by Leslie Newbegin, I think. Sometimes when you read several books at once, you forget who said what, and then you get confused, and then you can't find it the day before you're trying to share it with people. So... What he was saying, if it was in fact him that said it, and I think it was from the book Foolishness for the Greeks, but I dug through it and I could not find it. So um, he's making a point that when you try to um, understand Jesus like like this, like I'm just going to stand back and look and go, now that I feel like I get this, I'm comfortable with, you know. He's, he's saying you can't do that because he, he won't make sense that way. Like you might get some of the, he's like, okay, I get it. He gave me food. But then when he talks about being the bread of life, I'm like, what are you talking about? I got the food part, but I don't get this bread of life part. That doesn't make any sense to me. That's because you're trying to like keep it in your world and then just bring a little Jesus in. And he's saying you cannot do that because it doesn't make sense. And it also doesn't work. You'll notice repeatedly as we go through this gospel that when Jesus shows up, or people maybe even invite him into their little world, like we tend to sometimes, he just kind of breaks everything because to under, when he shows up, because he, what he is, Jesus is the creator God come as a man to do what man had to do but only God could do. That jamming together of things leads to a great deal of misunderstanding, okay? So it's okay to misunderstand, but you have to know that I think this is exactly, this is why I wanted to include this quote is, If you're trying to do this, if you're trying to live your little life and just invite a little Jesus in here, like my normal, like remember our literal life, like I'm just going to live my life, my real life. I don't want to bother anybody, but I want a little bit of Jesus so I know that I'm like good for the heaven thing or whatever, you know, and that's not going to work at all, ever. He doesn't just fit in. He completely takes over. That's why the language necessary to understand what does it mean to follow you or whatever. He's like, you have to be born again. That's the int- it's not like you have to have an enlightenment. You have to suddenly have an understanding. He doesn't say that. He says something impossible. You have to be born again. You need a new world to live in. So keep all of that in mind as we go through this. Starting at the beginning. After this, Jesus went around Galilee. He did. And this is after he's fed people and healed people and said to people, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And they were like, boy, boy. <laughs> okay. That's a little rough. but that, And so after that, Jesus went around in Galilee, and he did not want to go about in Judea because the Jewish leaders were looking for a way to kill him. Well, it's a good thing to stay away from. But when the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brothers said to him, leave Galilee and go to Judea so that your disciples there may see the works you do. Because he's been healing people now. All right? And, and, and dividing the food and the whole bit. You know, like he's making a difference, right? And then they say this, no one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. (laughs) Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world, which kind of seems reasonable, maybe, you know, because they're like, well, if you're the Messiah, go do it, I guess, you know. But here's the interesting thing. Read the next verse. Why did they say that? For even his own brothers did not believe in him. And so what I see in this is, we so often want to interact with Jesus like I was just talking about. Like they kind of are like, yeah, come on, why don't you prove 
that you're Jesus, then I'll believe you, you know. And I might even be able to, if I'm good, like these guys were, put it in phrases that sound like I'm giving you some really good spiritual advice or some just really good advice. Like if you're God, maybe you should act like it, you know. <laughs> and I think maybe you guys aren't like me, but if you, it dawned on me this week as I was praying through this, I was like, man, how often do we ask Jesus to prove himself to us? Or how often do I ask him, like, how often am I having this interaction? Like, I'm saying something that sounds great, like, God, why don't you show up in this thing we're doing or whatever? And it's kind of like, why don't you prove that you are who you are? Because maybe I don't even believe it or something like that. You know what I mean? That's this aggressive. I'm just amplifying it a little bit. But also this, how often do we like to just tell Jesus what to do? Be like, this is what you should be doing, you know, since you want to be a public figure and all. And you notice what he says back uh, that um, I didn't copy this into my thing. He basically just rebukes him and says, you guys don't even know what you're talking about. He goes, you, he goes, he goes the world, he, like, he, he reveals instantly they have no understanding. They want him to make a grand entrance, right? Show up like the guys are showing up. The Feast of Tabernacles is a big deal. It's a big celebration. You're going to be, you're going to show up and you're going to, you're going to wreck the place. You're going to be the big guy the big man on campus and everything. And he says, no, I'm not even going to do that. I'm not doing anything like what you want. And instead, he goes in secret. He actually says, I might not even go. Um, some translations say yet. Um, some don't. It doesn't really matter to me. I don't think he was lying to them. I think he was just saying, I'm not going to go do this thing you want me to do. So he goes in secret while the festival is going on. And people are kind of talking about it. They're like, well, you're, you're his guys. Where, do, where is he? You know, they're asking questions. Where is this guy? And you start to see these questions going out through the whole thing. You know, where is he? Some people are like, ah, this is a good guy, though. I mean, like, I, I think I heard about him healing people. Like, bad people don't heal people. Again, this is just like us, just like our world, trying to figure out who Jesus is by looking at what he's doing and trying to analyze it. You know, is this good? Is this not good? Some people are like, oh, he might be the Messiah, you know. And they're like, no, no, no. Other people are like, no, he's deceiving people. He's telling them lies, you know, just like people don't understand what Jesus is saying today. Verse 12 through 13, among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about him. Some said, he's a good man, and others replied, no, he deceives people. But no one would say anything publicly about him because fear of the leader. So again, nobody knows what to believe, and everybody's afraid of the guys that are in charge of things. So everybody's just kind of in a holding pattern. But everybody wants to know where Jesus is and what he's doing, which I think is the deep soul cry of everybody today, even if we don't know it. Jesus starts teaching at the temple like halfway through. He just kind of shows up and it's like, okay, I'll start doing my thing. But it's again, he showed up in secret. He didn't make a big entrance. And people are like, whoa, how does this guy know what he's talking about? Because, like, you know, these rabbis and stuff, they go to school their whole life, and this guy shows up out of nowhere and he knows more about it than everybody else, you know? And they're kind of shocked by this. And the people that are honest are like, <laughs> he obviously knows what he's talking about, but how? You know? And so Jesus answers them. Remember this whole thing we've been talking about, John the Baptist, Jesus, saying, like, all I'm doing is doing what I do and telling you about it. You're just not listening or believing me. It's not like a mystery. It's not like a puzzle you've got to put together. You don't have to use the Bible code and then find these weird, like, like, which isn't real, in case you were wondering. But the whole, like, you don't have to do that. He goes, I'm just telling you. You know, and so he says, my teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. And he's talking about God here. Which, and then he challenges their following of Moses' law. He's like, you know, uh, and you can read along as I'm kind of paraphrasing this, you know, that, uh, um, yeah, go to the next part. And so he's, he's, he's saying, like, he goes, you guys are acting like you're following the law. You're not even following it, you know. And, and then uh, go to verse 22. He says, yet because Moses gave you circumcision, and then he puts it in parenthetically, though actually it did not come from Moses but from the patriarchs, you circumcise a boy on the Sabbath. Meaning, like, if that seventh day came and it was the Sabbath, they're like, well, we'll go ahead and do this because this is the law, you know, even though it would, might count as work in their mind. And he's like, now if a boy can be circumcised on the Sabbath so, so that the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you so angry, or why are you angry with me for healing a man's whole body on the Sabbath? And then here's the, to me, this is kind of like, the, there's two cores to this whole thing. This is a big one. It's the first part, and it's kind of one of the titles I use for this. Stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. Imagine Jesus saying that to you right now. Stop judging by mere appearances. You're like, okay, well, what do I judge by? He says, instead judge correctly. Okay. It's very important 
if we've been living in a world where we're trying to separate these things, either for our own sake or even just because we don't like what normal is or, you know, the literal world or whatever, it's going to lead us to judge by appearances and judge by, like, you know, and, and as if the culture's not doing that anyway. Like, if Instagram isn't anything but judging by appearances, I don't know what it is, you know. And, uh... Jesus is commanding them, instead judge correctly. Go forward to verse 28. Then Jesus, still teaching in the temple courts, cried out, Yes, you know me, and you know where I am from. I am not here on my own authority, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him. Now pay attention to this. He's already starting to draw a point of where I am from. Who do you think he means by that? God. Remember the whole fish thing? It's kind of like that. It's like... (laughs) Is God in it? Yes. So that you can answer that. Yeah, he's talking about being from heaven or being from God, okay? He's not specifically talking about where he's from. Like, where are you from? Like, remember earlier, they're like, is anything good coming from Nazareth? That's kind of where he grew up. Where he's been hanging out now? Galilee. Where was he born? Bethlehem. He's not really talking about any of those places right now. But, but look at how people kind of respond, you know, because... And then he goes, look, I'm only with you for a short time. Again, he's just telling them the truth, okay? Straight up, honest truth. I'm only going to be with you for a short time. And, I'm, and then I'm going to the one who sent me. Again, where did I come from? Well, the one who sent me. This is God's stuff here. You will look for me, but you will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. Okay? So he's like, I'm going back to be with the Father in his heavenly realm. And so this is it. The Jews said to one another, where does this man intend to go where we can't find him? And then in case you were wondering what they meant, they were like, the Jews said to one another, well, oh, yeah, will he go to where our people live scattered among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? You know, and you can imagine Jesus be like, no, like what? You know, I mean, obviously he knows what they're thinking, but like we could read it like that. But I think so often Jesus, Jesus comes into our lives and lays out something very plainly. And we're like, what does that mean? You know? And it's like, I, it means what I said. Like, there's no, like, trick in it. It's not like a hidden thing. You're not going to be, like, in the secret club of people that get it. This, I'm just telling you the truth. You just, you just can't hear it or you're not hearing it. I don't know, you know? Because they're like, oh, he's going to go out, like, in, you know, like, in, like, where we call, like, Turkey and stuff. There was other Jewish people that were spread around. They're like, oh, he's, maybe he's talking about going there. But why, we could find him there, though, so I don't really, you know. They're just, they're totally stuck over here, you know? Only literal, only literal, only understanding him literally. And not just literally, but like just <laughs> so limited, you know? Where does this man intend to go that we can't find him? You know, you will look for me and not find me, you know? Where I'm going to, you cannot come. And so, verse 37, on the last day, oh, okay, so now we're shifting into the second big part about judging correctly. And now, so what's this whole thing about? He's going to Jerusalem, Feast of Tabernacles. What is he even talking about here, okay? On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. <laughs> I want to read this again. We've, I've, I've gone over, overboard trying to make the point of don't separate the spiritual and like literal or spiritual and physical or spiritual and whatever you want to call it, you know. Your normal life and your spiritual life, you can't do that. You just have a life, and it's both. And Jesus is in both, and God is in both. And in that kind of mindset, if Jesus says to us right now these words, what do you think they mean? Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from them. By this he meant the Spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. That's the Holy Spirit, guys. That God wants to put inside you the new temple of his Holy Spirit. Upon that time, the Spirit had not, uh, oh, sorry, up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So the Holy Spirit had come upon people, but it wasn't poured out on all flesh as Joel was prophesying. We saw that in Acts 2, and it still exists now, and it's still available to you. So you say, how does this work? How does this, how do I not thirst anymore? This is what he's talking about. And you could be like the woman at the well and go, okay, cool. So like, I don't have to drink Gatorade anymore. And it's like, no, like it's, this is a bigger deal than that. 
that's just a clue of what it's like. You know how when you're really thirsty, that's what your spirit is like. And he's saying, I can give you the water that quenches that. Because you can get Gatorade, you can't get this thing that I'm talking about. But let me explain a little bit of this background so that you even know what he's talking about and why he says that. Like, why is he all of a sudden talking about water? Like, he's teaching at the temple, okay, cool, like, we get that. That's kind of like a, you know, sounds like a churchy thing to do. But why are you talking about water right now? And why does the Feast of Tabernacles? So the Feast of Tabernacles, I thought about asking Steve and Marianne to come up and do like a two-minute thing, but... We'll go over it again, but it's the feast that you remember the wilderness, and it's still celebrated today. Steve Marion still celebrated. We might celebrate it here this year as a remembrance, and what it was supposed to be is God, there's instructions in Leviticus about moving outside your home for a certain number of days, seven days, and you live in the, just like they did. God got them out of slavery in Egypt, and they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, and God provided for them. And they would do this to remember that because you've got to go in your head that God's like, <laughs> you're, you're, you're me, like me, you needing me as a provider doesn't stop just when you get to the promised land. So part of this is we're going to, we're going to practice every year. You're going to remember how you need me. <laughs> and so they would get in the tents and they still do this now. 2022 Feast of Tabernacles will happen. Okay. And they're remembering dependence on God. And the instructions in Leviticus aren't super detailed. And so things got added to the, you know, the practice as the years went along. And all the things I'm going to tell you about, archaeologists, they know these were all happening by the time Jesus was like. So the context that I'm going to describe for you is based on this, but it got added to. Kind of like how, you know, how we have different Christmas traditions and stuff like that that come about from biblical things, but they're not specifically instructed, okay? God had instructions. Do this, build the booths, celebrate me, do some sacrifices and things like that. And then people would add like, well, we're also going to, we're going to interpret this one scripture by bounding together these uh, these certain branches and wave them in, this kind of thing, or we're going to hold this fruit up, you know, because it represents this first fruits thing or whatever, or the best fruits of the vine or whatever, or the the tree. Because it was a celebration of the harvest as well. They also had these gigantic menorahs they would light, which were like those candlesticks, just like the one Stephen Marion had. But they said they were so big that they were like torches. So it was like this huge festival, so much so, it was a joyous celebration harvest type festival, so much so that it was a tourist attraction then. You hear what I'm saying? Not like people go to a trip of the Holy Land now, like I'm going to fly over there. And, like people would boat over from wherever they were, to go to see this. Even people that weren't Jewish, apparently, because they found art, like, because <laughs> people, some things don't change, but, like, the tourist traps back then, guys would make stuff, and, like, hey, you want a little, you know, rem- commemorative whatever, and you can take it home, and people go, yeah, I do want that. And then they find it on Cyprus or whatever all these years later, and they go, gosh, we know where this came from, you know? So it was, a, it was such a big celebration, it was a tourist attraction even then. And they would light these menorahs, and they'd be lit. And it was like this, you know, big celebration at night. And it was supposed to be joyful. It was supposed to be celebr- you know, like it was celebrating God's provision and all these kinds of things. And they added this part to it where they would take water. It had to be living water. Living water is like rain or well water, these kinds of things. Not from a cistern or something like that. They would take this water, and they would use it. And they would, it was a big ceremony, this whole thing. And on the last day, they would pour the water out at the altar, they called it a libation. It's like, it's like a liquid offering to God, and they would sometimes add wine, I think, and this kind of thing. And it was supposed to thank God for the rain and all this kind of thing, but sometimes it turned into like kind of a rain dance. Like some people are like, you got to do this or God might not send the rain that you need, you know, because like this was at the end of like the harvest thing, but we need the winter rains to kind of get things going again, you know. So, you know, bring the water, do the water thing because we need to pray for rain. And when you live in the desert and you have an agricultural, you know, necessity, that's a big deal. And so they would do this on the last day. Now, did you know the day that Jesus went and said this? Verse 37, on the last and greatest day of the festival. So that's when this water thing happened. And they're pouring this water. And so it's almost like Jesus is like they're doing this. This is what we all came here to see. They're pouring the water. Isn't this awesome? And then Jesus is like, hey, 
If you're thirsty, you should come to me. And they're like, what are you doing? And he's, he gets in the way of it. And he's tell, again, that's a challenge probably to the, everybody that came to see the water thing, not that guy, whoever he is, and everybody that's doing the water thing because it's a big deal. And then Jesus is kind of saying, hey, I'm what this whole thing is about. And they're like, that's so offensive and wrong culturally. You know, and, but it's like, he's like, it's kind of like, what, maybe like what I was talking about earlier. Like, maybe I have my like normal little physical life over here. And Jesus is kind of coming in and from, you know, like, you're fine to be in the spiritual side. And he's like, no, this is, I'm about all of this. This whole thing is about me. And you're like, okay, what? What are you talking about? This doesn't make sense. And it's offensive because it bothers me. Because I'm fine if you stay on your side. You can be God over there. Be God in the God area. But don't mess with, like, my stuff. And he's like, that doesn't work. That isn't how this thing works. But what is he talking about? Rivers of living water will flow. <laughs> he's referring to several places. And he knows what he's referring to. There's prophecies about these rivers. One of the, the biggest one, was the only one I'll really talk about, is in Ezekiel 47, where you see this, this, he sees this vision of water flowing from the temple. And then they're like, and God's like, you should measure it. So he like measures it. And then he keeps going and he measures it and it's getting deeper and his measuring is getting wider and deeper and bigger and, and it gets to where he can't get even, like, it's too big now for me to even cross. So it's flowing from the presence of God out and it's this immense river, non-ending, totally sufficient for all needs or whatever. And then it's also making a future reference to, which they didn't have this yet, but when, when you deal with God, he kind of knows things if you haven't picked up. Revelation 22, the end of everything you see the same river talked about, and we'll read that in a second. The river flowing from the throne of God through the heavenly new Jerusalem, new creation. Now you go, this is kind of getting the spiritual. It's like, yes. But is it physical and literal? Yes. Is it our life? Yes. <laughs> Don't do this. It's like, well, okay, oh, cool, I'll get you here, but not here. No, it's all of this. And so how does that matter? Because what Jesus is saying in this exact moment then, and he's saying it now, is, hey, you know the wilderness? Remember when you were in the wilderness? Remember when I gave you the bread and the water in the wilderness? You know how you're in the wilderness now? This whole world is a wilderness. It's not like, okay, promised land, we're all good. You know, and even if you think you are, he's like, you still need to do this celebration so that you remember. He's saying you're in the wilderness and you're consumed by your lack. Some of you, it's, it's what you need and what you want. Some, in our culture, it's mostly what we want, but sometimes it's what we need. Like with them, they were like, we need food. Why did God bring us out of here? Just to, We were in prison. That was better than not having food. Or where's the water? Like we, at least we had water from the Nile River when we were in Egypt back in prison, which is kind of like what we say. It's like, well, you know, when I, before I followed Jesus, back when I was in chains, at least, at least I knew how to control things. At least I knew how to get my own way, or at least I could, you know, all that sort of thing. What he's saying here is, you know, your wilderness, where you're totally consumed by what you need and what you want. If I could just have this other thing, then I'll finally make it. If I could just be this other person, then I would finally be happy with myself. Or young people, if you're going, I don't know who I am. I don't know what I was made for. I don't know why I exist. I may not even understand what I think about gender or any of these things like that. I can't figure out why God would make me the way I am. And he's saying, the only way you're going to figure that out is to come to me and I'll explain it to you. And the Holy Spirit will come inside you and it will give you new life. And if you say, that doesn't make any sense, I would say, you're right. And they thought the same thing. But it's the truth. And if you said, how? I would tell you, I don't know. Other than he said that that's what will happen. And I've seen it happen. And if you heard anything in what Cheryl shared earlier, it happens. But you can't do it like this. Prove yourself and maybe I'll get in on it sometime later, you know, because I'm good with what I'm doing right now. It doesn't work like that. And if you're tired of being stuck in the wilderness, 
consumed by needs, consumed by wants, consumed by feeling like even... (laughs) He might have been going as far as to say, this whole thing you're doing doesn't make the rain come. It's not like you go, okay, God's like, you poured enough water so it's cool now. You know, I'm not sure he was saying that. But I think he's saying that like, even if you're doing everything you think is right to make this work, you don't need to do that anymore. You just need to come to me. And that's it. And then he will explain to you who you are, what you were made for. That is the rebirth because you're still here, but you're also here. You have the rivers of the living water inside you now, and that might not change much of this. Sometimes it does. Jesus was healing people's bodies. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't, but it changes everything. And it's not anything you can just try harder to do. It's something he has to do. And this is offensive, and it challenges everyone. And you can read the latter part of this. It isn't like everybody goes, oh, cool, that's good. All I got to do is go to this guy and drink and everything. Like, it starts this whole part. It's like, well, this guy's claiming to be God? Like, what's he talking about? And it's, it's interesting because you start to see um, this whole, uh, um, I, I lost it in my notes or whatever. But anyway, it doesn't matter. You start to see this whole exchange that's happening. And uh, the priests are mad. Everybody's mad. They're like, go get this guy. We're going to arrest him. They can't get him. And, you know, and then... You know, they get all upset again about, like, where he's from. He's, this guy's from Galilee. He can't be the Messiah. The Messiah's supposed to be from Bethlehem. And nobody went like, well, actually, he was born in Bethlehem. But uh, because but they're really not stuck on that. They're stuck on, it. They're stuck on it. is this guy from God or not? The real source. So even that wouldn't matter. You know what I mean? Because they would find something else. And it's funny because remember Nicodemus, the guy who snuck in to see Jesus right a couple chapters ago because he was like, how do, I, how do we do this? How do you know? He's still hanging out with these guys because he's, and it's almost like he's from the back. And he's like, maybe we shouldn't condemn him, you know. And they're like, what, are you his follower now too? And they don't ever answer that. You know, they're like, you can look in the scriptures. He's not from Galilee. And the whole thing I see in that is that there will always be objections to Jesus. And even though, in my mind, none of these really make sense, and they all have answers. So it's like, well, like, do these have answers? Like, they actually did, but like, it wouldn't have sufficed at all because they're, they're not the main point. It doesn't matter if he's from Bethlehem or not. I mean, it does from the prophecy standpoint, but it doesn't matter. It's like if you could still find something else. You're like, oh yeah, well, what about this then? You're like, oh yeah, well, what about this then? You know, you can do that if you want, or you can come to him and drink. But if you say this is difficult and I don't understand it, <laughs> this is a funny thing. I'm just going to read this to you. Because in all of this, even that reference to Galilee, which seems so random to us, like, you're like, why are you going back to the whole Galilee thing? Because they thought they had him. You see what I'm saying? Like, I got him now. He's not from the right place. He can't be the guy. Isaiah 8 says this. Do not call conspiracy everything this people calls a conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear. And do not dread it. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. He will be a holy place for both Israel and Judah. And listen to this. He will be a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, he will be a trap and a snare. Many of them will stumble. They will fall and be broken. They will be snared and captured. This was happening at this moment. And it's not like Jesus is like, this is what I want to do. I want to snare. We were just singing, my chains were broken. And that's what he's doing. I'm here to set the prisoners free. He claims those verses with, with John the Baptist's disciples and stuff like that. So he's not here to, what he's saying is, if you're going to interact like this, if you're going to be one of those people, it's going to be a trap for you. It's not going to be freedom. It's going to be a trap. It's going to make things worse. And, he, and I think that 
we know that he was referring to this, or at least this was in the mind of John writing this down or however, because listen to this. I'm going to read you this quote. It's, it's, it's not too long, but I just I encountered this. I was going to leave it out, but I was like, you know, this is too important. It's from a Jews for Jesus article, that, which was about the Feast of Tabernacles. It says this, the prophet, the Messiah, cannot come from Galilee. Yet in their blindness, they themselves fulfilled a prophecy which had been written hundreds of years earlier. We find it recorded in the eighth chapter of the book of Isaiah, shortly before he predicted that a great light, remember those menorahs? A great light would come from Galilee. Isaiah said, do not call conspiracy everything that, ha- that these people call conspiracy. From Galilee, Isaiah, Isaiah said, oh, wait, sorry, do not call conspiracy everything. Do not fear what they fear and do not dread it. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread, and he, he will be a sanctuary, for, but for both houses of Israel, he will be a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall, and for the people of Jerusalem, he will be a trap and a snare. Okay. Isaiah then proceeded to speak of Galilee, the despised portion of the land of Israel given to Zebulon and Naphtali. The region was located on the main trade route connecting the great powers of Assyria and Babylon, with Egypt and North Africa. It therefore became known by the derogatory appellation of Galilee of the Goyim, which means like the nations or the other people, because of the pagan corruption which had resulted from the contact with those foreigners. And yet, this despised town of Galilee would be honored one day because, said the prophet Isaiah, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. That's Isaiah 9-2, which is what we usually read at Christmas. Remember those menorahs I was talking about? Remember how that wasn't even part of the, script, the, the scriptural pr- like practice of Sukkot? That was added even later. A light would come, a light so bright that it would outshine even the glorious illumination of the temple at Sukkot. Isaiah spoke of the enlarging of the nation and the increase of joy, the joy of the harvest, because a child is born... To us a son given, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. That's all at the beginning of Isaiah. That's la- that last part was 9-6. His rule, we are told, will expand. Remember that river in Ezekiel 47? Cover the whole earth and will never cease. And he will bring the great harvest of the nations. So Jesus, in just pointing at the water, is telling everybody kind of everything. And just like <laughs> just like March with the question, like, is Jesus in this? Yes. What about this thing that shouldn't have Jesus? Is he here? Yes. This is the world we live in now. And I'm going to read you this because I suspect that even many of us here that claim we follow Jesus have been living some version of my life, my, my spiritual life. And you, and you need to delete those categories. It's like go in the computer and put everything in the same folder and it's just called life. And then what happens after that, <laughs> we're just going to leave up to God because if you go to him and drink, the Holy Spirit can come live with And so I think some of us need to really ponder the alternative, because that wilderness, without the provision of God, is the beginnings of hell. And some of us have been there, not to the full extent of what hell could be, but like you've tasted the hopelessness of it. The only end of that is to come to him and drink. And if you go, that's silly sounding and offensive and doesn't make any sense, that's fine. It was prophesied that people would think that way. But that doesn't make it not true. And I would be lying if I told you anything else. (laughs) And I'm going to read you this. This river is talked about in Revelation 22. The heading on my Bible here says, Eden Restored. And then I'm going to play for you a song that I wrote that was actually based on this, uh, this scripture. But I want to invite you during that time, when the song is playing, 
if you need to come and spend some time praying with God, or if you need, if you just say, I've never, I don't know about this being filled with the Holy Spirit thing, and I want that. I want you to come forward, and I want some of the people in the prayer team to be up here as well, and we'll just be available to pray for people while the song is playing. But I want you to contemplate this, guys, because even if this makes no sense to you, even if everything I said to you sounded foreign and boring or crazy, if you're consumed by not knowing who you are or why you exist or what God made you for, or you're consumed with all your needs, like if I could just get this figured out, if I could just get this job, or if I could just get this degree, or if I could just get this, that's some form of living in this wilderness. And Jesus is offering you the way out. And it looks something like this. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life. This is John, the same John, talking about this. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the trees of life, that stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city, and all the servants will serve him. They will see his face. His name will be on their foreheads, and there will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord will give them light. And he will reign forever and ever. So, Father, we we stand before you as people hearing you saying to us, come to me and drink. And for many of us, we don't even know what that means, but we know what it is to be thirsty. And so many of our souls are extremely thirsty. So I ask, Lord, out of your mercy, that any of us that are thirsty, that you would come and fill us as your word promises. And we want to come to you and drink, Lord, that you might fill us with your spirit. And you would do that this morning and this time in Jesus' name. So come forward if you need prayer, and we want to pray for you.